you guys have succeeded. You just don't see it yet. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you might want to just like pause now, just give it like a quarter, just take a quarter off and see what happens. Welcome to the Cash Flow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Katani, and the founder of Katani Capital Group. For the last two years, I've been studying alternative assets and now help solve the problem of creating passive cash flow for creators, influencers, and busy professionals by bringing you five episodes a week of easy to understand education in the world of passive investing. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Chronicles. I'm your host, Johnny Catani, and I'm joined today by Skylar Cadwalder. He's a co-founder and managing partner of UpWealth Capital, a real estate private equity group that helps medical professionals build passive income via multifamily real estate investing. He attended the University of Pennsylvania Weitzman School of Design, where he earned his Master's of Architecture. He has deep experience in multifamily design, entitlement, project management, and construction administration. He also manages a personal portfolio of multifamily properties that has been involved in over $60 million in real estate transactions. His primary roles at UpWealth Capital are underwriting, deal analysis, due diligence, and overseeing the growth and vision of the company. Skylar, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Johnny. Really excited to be here. Great to have you. Uh, it was great to meet you at Best Ever. Love, uh, love when I can have uh, friends from real life on the podcast. Yeah, it was great to meet you too. It was great to uh, put a face to a name and get together with a gang out there. Totally, totally. So uh, you've got a great resume, obviously. Um, you studied architecture, got your master's in architecture. Take us back then and kind of when was the genesis moment of like, you know, okay, there's something to real estate aside from, you know, the architecture side and and what led you to where you're at now? Yeah, sure. So I was kind of, a, I guess you would call more the creative type, you know, when I was uh, younger and I always loved just buildings, you know, which is kind of like just loving real estate, but, you know, specifically the aesthetics of it. So uh, wound up going to grad school, uh, getting to work in architecture and, and really enjoyed it, you know, for a, a long time. But I did get this increasing sense uh, over time that like, this is never going to pay as much as I want it to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Granted, you could start your own architecture practice and scale a business. That's that's one way to do it off. But I, I didn't really love the business of architecture, it's a very, uh, it's a very hard, it's a tough business. There's, it's, it's a ton of work. You're basically just always having these huge, massive uh, sprints and um, you don't get really equity in the pro projects that you work on, right? So you are a hired gun, you are paid a, a dollar amount for an hour of your time. It's a one-to-one -one trade that you're making. And you're never really snowballing in, in wealth. You know, you're not like building your own portfolio and making money while you sleep by doing that. So um, the last five years of practice, I was in multifamily and working with some multifamily, um, obviously, developers. And I just kept finding myself across the table from these guys and being like, that's where I want to be. This is like, a, that's that's the per better person to be. This is like the main character. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, because they're coming in on their cell phone telling me to, do this, do that, and then dashing off in their, uh, you know, Porsche to the next call or the next meeting with some other architect. And I'm like, this person's building massive wealth. And that seems really exciting. And as much as I was excited to have, oh, this is a really good design. I'm glad we're having the grand opening. I'm very proud of that. It would be like next day, you're just on something else. Like that, that thing is just over. You have nothing to do with it anymore. Uh, you might get invited to the opening party. That's it, you know? And so, Needed to get on the other side of the table. Uh, I've also got some family who are real estate investors who've done well for themselves, uh, including my father-in-law. And uh, I just realized we, we have to find a way to make a little bit more money in our sleep and build a better foundation for our family. So, Totally. I love that. Yeah, it, it's true. Uh, when you, it's funny being on that side, right? And you like see these guys and you're like, okay, uh, yeah. there's something over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And at first it's sort of like, I think I had like this total like poor uh, mindset about it at first where I just, you know, when you're kind of like, you don't grow up around a lot of entrepreneurship and a lot of like super ambitious people, you kind of assume these people are already at the top. Oh, that must have been like a rich kid or something, or they, they already had some advantage that I don't understand or know about, or they're just like bad people. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> and so I just had like this, like, I guess, judgmental sort of, uh, perspective on it and then just gradually as I got older and hopefully somewhat wiser and smarter to kind of shed that and realize like no this is I don't I think maybe I'm the one who's not uh you know reading the board very well here and it's time to make a change 
Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? Cause I, I have the same kind of background. Um, in fact, I'm pushing my dad to read rich dad, poor dad for mm. kind of this exact reason to kind of change his, his mindset around money and investing and whatnot. Whoa. And it is fascinating being an entrepreneur and kind of the only one in the family. My grandfather was, but um, he since passed. And it's fascinating because you realize like, okay, these people like had ambition and like just had a vision and went after it. That's the only yeah. thing that makes them different than someone right. who's raised in a nine to five is just that, that w decision to go for it. Um, yeah. It's, it's funny how like, you know, we grow up with these like really frightening sayings, like 99% of entrepreneurs fail and all this stuff. But like, you come to realize when you get to know entrepreneurs, it's like, yeah, all of them, all of the ones that are really successful failed like three times before they were successful. So like right. those stats yeah. are not actually very useful um, because every entrepreneur fails like three times and then the hockey stick. Right. So, yes. Um, so it's kind of a, an interesting that you just, we just come at it with this attitude of like, Oh, you gotta be borderline crazy. <laughs> and if it works out, it's because you got lucky. And it's like, actually, no, it's actually the most sane thing to do. And you just have to be relentless for years longer than you think you know what yes I mean? and uh and then one day you're an overnight success right yeah right and then everybody sees the overnight success and what they don't see are the sleepless nights and the 12 hour days totally and all of that and you know they're like oh like you said they they think you got lucky but what you realize in that hockey stick are mistakes all along the way totally you see the average person sees it as a failure right but it's really as cliche as it is, it's only fail if you quit. I've already yeah. made countless mistakes that have cost me, you know, Same. money. And it's yeah. like, well, you just kind of play through and it's like, well, I'm not going to give up. You know, I just yeah. learned how not to do that thing. Right. Exactly. I, I try not to think of it as failure so much as just data, right? Yes. It's just information. Like it, and the more it hurts, the more that information <laughs> will leave an imprint and the less likely, and you just start running out of mistakes to make. Yes. You know, sometimes success isn't success. It's just not making any more mistakes, right? For long enough. Correct. You know, if you, if you go on a 10 year stretch where you don't make a mistake, you're going to be very wealthy. Correct. <laughs> you know? Yes. And that's what I tell people. It's going to take you 10 years, whether yeah. you start now or you start in 10 years from now. So it's like, yeah. you know, um, do it and don't expect anyone to support you along the way. Like no. things where I, I found it amazing. Like when I transitioned from architecture and tried to start this business, it takes so much, like, you got to really get yourself excited about it and psyched up. And it's a, it's a huge leap of faith. And you kind of, at first, uh, expect people to be like, yeah, that's awesome. But everyone's just like, are you crazy? Like, what do you mean? Yeah. That's a little weird. Like, you want to be a slumlord? I'm like, wait, what? Uh, <laughs> like, no. And so it, that's, in some ways, the hardest part is that most people, I think a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs, but then they start down that road. And it's just, you do not get any support for doing that. You know no support. I mean? It's lonely. It's for very sure. lonely. Yeah. And uh, because I think what ends up happening and, and, you know, I don't want it, this is pure space, but I think a portion of it is the psychology where people see you doing the thing that they wish they could go do. Yeah. And they're like, well, you know, they, they don't want to, right. They don't want to support you. Not that they're necessarily rooting for you to fail, but they're not going to support you because yeah. You and were, you went out and took that leap and, and, you know, yeah. still sitting you behind might, a desk. You might be accidentally highlighting an insecurity, right? Correct. By, by making that change. There's a great Naval Ravikant thing he says, where it's like, it's not going up the mountain. That's hard. It's coming down. Right. And I think sometimes we all go up a mountain with friends and family and colleagues. And that day you decide, you know, I want to go up the mountain over there. And you start on your way down. No one is like applauding you. They're just like, oh, you're like you're too good for architecture now or you know what I mean it's just sort of like oh geez this is a little bit getting uncomfortable and then I, I describe it as the valley between the mountains where you're transitioning but you know your old friends aren't coming with you your new friends haven't accepted you yet and you just have to plow through that and then you know eventually you come up the other side and find a better view totally yeah it, it's wild and then and then you make it right or make it quote unquote right you kind of right. get to a certain point and then you're accepted in these new circles and all of a sudden your friends are entrepreneurs too. And exactly, you're like, okay, it was worth it, but man, it's not easy. And uh, it's not for everyone either too. That's the totally. other thing that I realized, but it's symbiotic, especially in this industry where we can help busy professionals who 
there are people totally. who love what they do, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. A lot of engineers, doctors, love what they do. Great passive investors because, hey, now you can just retire early, earlier than you mm-hmm. thought, but you get to keep, you know, you get to stay in your profession and and do the thing that you actually enjoy doing. I just did not enjoy the corporate world. Totally. Like you didn't really either. What was kind of that moment? Did you already have a portfolio and kind of a business or did you just burn the ships and jump in? <sighs> You know, man, I kind of had my ships burnt for me. So we basically, we bar- purchased our first property uh, before we actually bought it. I actually switched to part-time because I was entertaining the idea that if we make this purchase, uh, I can attain real estate professional status. So we can get into what that means if you want, but for now. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to define it just for the listeners yeah, who don't so, know. So if you're, if you, it's a IRS tax designation that says if you basically spend 750 hours a year and more time on real estate than your any other job, then you are designated a real estate uh, professional. And the main advantage you get from that is that any losses you take from your real estate investing can be written off from your household W-2 income. So I'm an architect. I've got a pretty reasonable income. My wife is a doctor. She's got a pretty strong income. And so my thinking was, if I purchase a nice, good chunk of real estate uh, and do like a cost segregation study and generate some pretty massive losses that way, um, we can reduce our W-2 income, taxable income for the year and get a large tax return. And so that was kind of like my thinking. So we were looking at first at duplexes and we realized we had to go bigger to, you know, justify the... uh, cost seg study and actually get like the kind of losses that are meaningful. So we wound up uh, making an offer on an eight unit that we were like, <laughs> we were so nervous as our first property. We were like almost hoping we didn't get it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and like within like a couple month period, um, a lot of kind of crazy things happened. So COVID broke out, right? And my wife is a doctor and we are based in Seattle. So suddenly, uh, and she is pregnant. So suddenly oh. she, She's having to go take care of critically ill patients with an unknown pandemic virus while pregnant. And we're kind of just freaking out. Um, But that was also a very big light bulb moment that like, wow, we uh, don't have the kind of flexibility we wish we had to keep our family safe. Um, Because again, bear in mind, this is the very beginning. We had no idea if it would transmit to um, unborn children or what the risks involved with that were. So it was frankly quite scary. Um, and it's before even the rest of the country had even seen it yet. Uh, and, and then soon, soon after that, you know, we made the offer on the property. My company, I had switched to part time. This is early 21 now at this point, and they went out of business uh, due to the pandemic. So, and it was three days, four days after our first child was born. Um, we basically got, uh, I got a call while I was in the pediatrician's office. Uh, my phone just kept bringing off the hook. I was like, I gotta go take something. And it was like my boss saying like, yep, declaring bankruptcy. Uh, it's like a Wednesday, anything you need to know, you have to figure out by Friday. Cause there just will not be anybody left to ask after this weekend. And I was just like, okay, sweet. So there goes the paternity leave, uh, money and all that. And then we found out that our offer was accepted on the eight units. So it was just like, it was just like so much <laughs> happening at once. Anyway, so that, that was kind of how we, quote unquote, burned the ships. We were kind of, I, it was, in a lot of ways, when I look back, I, it could have worked out better because I had one foot out the door, right? I switched to like part-time. I was trying to kind of, and I suddenly just got like a violent shove, you know, the rest of the way through. And it was sort of like, okay, like I, this is kind of what I want to do anyways. The property, we, we actually wound up, it's in our hometown, like on the west side of Buffalo, New York. So we flew home. I didn't have a job to go back to. My wife was on maternity leave went to the property, did a lot of work on it, got the hours I needed. We wound up being able to write off like over $170,000 in losses from our W-2 income that year. Sick. Yeah. And so that tax return hit and it was like, okay, yep, here we go. This is this is the new plan. Like, uh, And so, yeah, and that's been kind of the adventure ever since. That's sort of, that was our test run, our sort of proof of concept. It worked. And now we're just trying to incrementally scale into a a proper business and just make sure that we're doing it slowly and doing it the right way because you know we don't need uh money desperately we we want to make sure we're being very careful so that's the that's the story wow that's uh quite the story nothing like being thrown in the deep end with echo weights on you know what i mean but um, yeah yeah it works though you you learn to swim (laughs) yes absolutely i love that so 
Um, you've got a personal portfolio and Upwealth. Are they the same? Do you use Upwealth as your per or or they're completely separate? They're actually completely separate. So we've got like a Wyoming based LLC. That's our umbrella company. And then we have a, a state LLC for our uh, eight unit. And then, um, so we're probably will continue growing our personal portfolio as we go as well. And so we'll create new LLCs for each of those that go under the umbrella company in Wyoming. And then Upwealth is just like a totally different bucket. Got it. Okay. And what is Upwealth's portfolio like? We basically just have one property in there right now. It's a South Carolina uh, class A multifamily property sort of near uh, Myrtle Beach. And it's performing really well. We're super excited about it. We're happy to be involved with that one. And uh, it was a co-GP for us. First one with a very reputable sponsor, which was great because uh, as you probably know, it's like, it's, it's hard to work with the best in the business. You know, there's a lot of people who would love to work with you who haven't really done much <laughs> or generated much returns yet. Maybe they've got, maybe they've done a lot of acquisitions, but not a whole lot of, uh, uh, sales. So that's all going really well. And yeah, now, you know, we're just kind of lying in wait, looking at deals all the time. I'm underwriting all the time and trying to find one that, that worked for us. Yeah, it is a, uh, very interesting time it's very stagnant you know transaction yeah. volumes down sellers still have not capitulated it feels like really the only deals that are happening are these distressed sellers yeah uh, anything worth looking at is kind of a distressed seller um you know right. whether they're in trouble with debt or right. they need to re recapitalize another property um are you seeing are you able to find anything you mentioned offline as well. You're looking at seller financing. Mm -hmm. Anything jumping out at you yet or still just Not interest really. rates too high? What, what seems to be killing the deals the most? Is it the interest rates? Yeah, it's the interest rates. And I just, yeah, like you said, the sellers just haven't come down to earth. They're trying to sell at cap rates that I don't think really make sense anymore with the interest rates where they are, you know? And it's just like the interest rate has to be five and a half percent and you're trying to sell a four cap right now i, I just you know that's a tough sell <laughs> you know, i just i'm not seeing it most of the time even with the larger down payments that you obviously have to do i think what's going to be interesting too is so yeah a lot of the deals i'm looking at i would say are being a little creative i use that you know in some cases creative i, I almost mean that as like a wink like i don't think this is really good what they're doing here <laughs> right uh, where it's just like I don't know, they're, the exit cap's just not there. You know, they're kind of making believe that the going in cap rate is lower. They're making some adjustments to make it look lower so that when they add the 50 basis points for the exit cap, uh, it makes sense. But that actual exit cap is more like the current cap rate, not a potentially higher future cap rate. Or, you know, I think some of the deals, obviously, when they're assuming loans, you know, th those are the ones that are kind of looking a little bit more interesting. But yeah, it's it's going to be interesting over the next several months because we keep seeing these crazy things happening in the lending world, you know. Now First Republic is is gone. You know, now gone. it's a major yeah. There's a major lot of real estate lender. professionals at First Republic. I know, you know, I'm not going to name names, but I we both know some very prominent people in the industry yeah. and I'm sure there were more. That's just who I know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously, you know, they've moved on and and whatnot, but um man, yeah. And so I'm kind of just, I'm, I think this whole banking thing, I, I don't, I don't really fully know what to make of it, to be perfectly honest with you, because we keep saying, oh, okay, we're, it's over, we're past it. And then it's kind of keeps happening, you know, and I'm kind of getting to the point where like, okay, where, when does this actually stop happening? And is this, I have a feeling, you know, liquidity is going to continue drying up. And what's going to, this is what's going to be really painful in the next like 12 months is the deals will finally arrive and you're not going to be able to get the the financing you would hope to get to, to execute them, right? So, and that's kind of the thing about like an actual downturn that I think we kind of forget in hindsight, you know what I mean? It's just like, sure, they're on sale, but they're on sale because the, you can't, no one can buy it. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? And so we're very comfortable right now staying pretty heavy in cash uh, knowing that we might have to come in with like enormous down payments when the real sales come, you know, much bigger than we're used to. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely feels like one of those sort of 
like normally I wouldn't tell people to sit and and wait, right? Like the old yeah. scared money don't make money. But yeah, this is one of those moments where it's like, yeah, you actually do want to err on the side of caution. And if you don't make a move, no one's going to fault you for it. Now, of right. course, we're, we might look back in 10 years and be like, oh man, you know, but- the moment, yeah, totally. Right, but you'd rather have that than like, I should have not done that. And, you know, because yeah. the last thing you- the last thing you want is to not be able to return, at least return investor capital. Totally, yeah. And then you're dead in the water, right? That's a nightmare scenario, yeah. And so, that's the thing, like, it'd be one thing if the deals that you and I were looking at right now were like, ooh, that's pretty tempting, but I think they'll get even better. But I'm looking at a lot of them like, I this is not really that great to begin with. So it's not like, it's not like I'm like looking a gift horse in the mouth where like the deals are suddenly getting really good. And I'm just like saying, no, no, I'm going to try to time the bottom. I think they're going to get even better. I just, I don't even think it's really kicked off yet, you know, and it's, it seems impossible that it's not going to happen. Right. Interest rates have just gone up way too fast on people. We know there's pain. We've seen now a couple of uh, pretty big uh, nasty things happening, especially in office. I mean, office is like a whole, Oh man, ball game. It's a bloodbath over there. And it's, I don't even know if we felt the effects in the industry of office yet either. That's the thing. Like, I don't even think it seems to be like, I describe it as like that wily coyote moment where, you know, he's off the cliff, but hasn't fully looked down yet. And I don't think we've just as a country even processed, like how big of a disaster this might be yet. I mean, some of these, I don't know if you just saw that San Francisco building, it's, it was pot for like 300 and i think now it's being auctioned off and it's at like 60 million or something like that i mean it's like an 80 percent drawdown you can't even give them away yeah that's the thing and i get it i don't think i want one of those i, don't, I wouldn't know what to do with it <laughs> no so, so anyways yeah long story short like we're i think what we're both echoing is we're still just kind of i don't want to say at the very early stages but we're kind of just figuring out how uh how high this fall off for wiley coyote really is and what are the second order consequences of all this, right? Um, wh wh how are we going to get hit? Who's going to get hit in ways we don't even know? Um, so we got to still wait for some, a few more dominoes to tip, I think. Totally. And oh, by the way, the con the U.S. government is at default risk right now as well. So it's right. like, man. Yeah. And now, yeah, this default risk thing too, I think is not really, I'm not sure that's fully priced in right now. You know? I don't think it's baked in yet. I think everyone's assuming... I mean, you uh, look at what happened in 2011 and that crumbled the markets for a little bit because they yeah. decided in the 11th hour. But it's one of those things where like you listen to economists and they're like, you know, if the Republicans try to, you know, won't let anything get through and try to be like, ha, oh, look how bad the Democrats are fiscally, they'll instantly regret it when the government, yeah. when the U.S. goes it, like one of those things where like, wow, we should have never done that. So it's like, yeah, you know, you, you hope something comes, but. Phew. Yeah. It's one of those weird things though, where you're like, you're like, they, they can't possibly be that stupid. Can they? And then right. you yourself that these are like us Congress people and they <laughs> absolutely can be that stupid. Like there's like, it's actually highly likely that they will find a way to screw this up or push it a little far where they thought it was safe, but actually the market just flips on them. And it's like, Oh no, we take it back it's too late. You know what I mean? You spooked us and it's, it's tough. It's tough. And the fed is for sure going to raise interest rates. Uh, yeah, again, relentless. well, as of this recording would be tomorrow, I believe right. is when they meet, mm -hmm. they're going up another 25 basis points and they're, you know, planning on pausing. And it's like, gosh, I know. And how many yeah. banks need to go down and like how much needs to break before they're like, okay, maybe we should not, you know, yeah. but yeah, I think it's interesting. It's, it does seem like their real goal is to break the labor markets is what I'm finally is. How have they not? Where, where are all these people? I all know. I see are tech layoffs left and right. And yet somehow we're like a 3% unemployment rate for the country. I'm like, I know it's, it is really crazy. And I, I, again, I think it's the Wiley Coyote thing where it's like, you guys have you guys have succeeded. You just don't see it yet. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you might want to just like pause now. Just give it like a quarter. Just take a quarter off and see what happens. Because I think actually just leaving rates at an elevated state. I mean, we're seeing CPI come down, and we're very yes. close to the point where CPI is lower than the federal funds rate, which is a watershed moment, right? Um, you're kind of right side up again, and I'm sort of like like get there and then just relax because. I don't know things are breaking, you know, and I know we're kind of backstopping them, but I, I don't, I don't know where this ends, you know? 
Yeah. And my thing too, is like a lot of the data and information they wait on, it's very lagging, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got deals, you know, with rates locked in that they started three months ago, you know what I mean? So yeah, totally. we haven't even got, well, we're just barely getting to the, like the really high interest rate deals, which is why you're seeing transaction volume so low and so many assumptions because no deal can really get done in today's debt market unless your basis is really, you know, that yeah. low. Um, and it just we, feels like they just want to keep pulling that lever. And it's like, you guys, things are breaking. Like, yeah, right. You like, know? Maybe to slow down. Cause what you and I both know very well is that just leaving them where they are for say in the next 18 months is still going to wreak absolute havoc. Yes. Without raising even uh, one more basis point. There are still people right now who are in the red who are frankly praying that they come back down by the time their debt expires or their cap rate or the rate cap expires or whatever. And they're just, you know, in a really tough spot. And that's just like every week that is happening. You know what I mean? So totally, it's like, just let's leave it where it is. The, the pain is still being distributed every single day. Just like slow it down. Um, and yeah, I think it, this might wind up being one of those cases of uh, be careful what you wish for, because uh, I think if the labor market does break, it might break to the downside way more than anyone expects. Yeah. And then they're going to come with their tail between their legs like, oh, man, maybe we did raise rates a little too fast and too high. And you're like, well, can't change it in hindsight like, now. Well, maybe you get a lot of Fed go. minutes in hind with hindsight talk like, yeah. oh, you know, in like 2014, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, we might have done that incorrectly back you know and you're just like oh man i know so, it's it's a it's a it's a peculiar thing to behold it'd be one thing if their track record recently was pretty good right when they lowered interest rates to zero for a way too long despite inflation letting it right. run hot and now it's just like man they're just spinning the wheel in the other direction with like the steepest hiking cycle we've ever seen so it's heavy over correction yeah so put your uh investor hat on let's end on a good note what are some opportunities you know What's some stuff we can look for that, because there are still deals happening that are good deals. So yeah. what are you kind of seeing when you see a good deal? What do you look for? You know, what's come across your desk where you're like, okay, this, this piques my interest. Yeah. Uh, like I said, before we, we started recording here, I'm sort of looking at smaller deals right now that uh, have potential for seller financing. You know, I think in the mom, if you can find some mom and pop owners, maybe, Maybe you have to leave the hottest markets in the country. I know none of us want to do it, but maybe, maybe we can find some markets where, you know, you can find that 40, 60, 80 unit property that's been owned since 1995. And you can work out a nice little seller finance deal, something that keeps cash flowing for the, the current owner, but gets your foot in the door at a reasonable uh, price, <laughs> you know? I, but I think now is the time where you kind of have to think, creatively because you know what the brokers are going to be filling your inbox with i'm just not seeing much there you know and i don't know if the brokers are telling the sellers what they can get or if, i guess a lot of sellers are just in a position to just kind of like cast out a line see if they get any nibbles but are, otherwise are happy to hold so you know i think in these moments uh in the market where you just got a huge gap between the bid and the ask, and it's a total stalemate, you got to think outside the box. Maybe you got to go smaller than you thought. Maybe you got to go to markets you didn't consider. Maybe a whole different type of deal structure than you've ever done before. Because if you don't, I, I don't know, for me, it's just looking at bad deals all day. And it's sort of like, I got to find something better to do with my time. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, but, you know, like we kind of said, you know, staying in cash, not a bad, not a bad no. thing. But, you know, it's important one thing I'll say is it is important to keep your ear to the ground totally. because you're not going to know a good deal. If you're not yeah. looking at deals, you're not going to know a good one when it comes along. So 100%. it is still important, you know, pay attention. Yeah. Um, this thing where people say their pencils down. I'm like, well, no, never go pencils down. No. If your pencils down, then you don't, you literally, what is it? You miss all the shots you don't take, you know, yeah. like you won't even have the opportunity. So pencils staying very sharp. Uh, and then when the deal comes, it'll be so obvious, right? Yes. It'll jump off the page. Totally. Yep. Yep. I love it. Awesome. Well, Skylar, I appreciate all of your insight. This has been a great conversation. Um, let's go ahead and wind down here. We'll jump to the final five. Uh, sure. First question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Oh, man. You know, the one that I'm leaning on right now is a, an Alex Ramosi quote that I really like, where he says, if the cost, of peace of, if the cost is peace of mind, it's too expensive. 
And so, you know, there's a, and this kind of goes back to the deals we're looking at right now, where like, I don't want to like hold my nose and buy, you know what I mean? I don't, I want to sleep at night. And so that means sitting on some cash or finding these unusual deals. I think that's probably, uh, that's, that's, that's something I'm thinking about a lot is just keeping peace of mind through all this. Totally. I love that. Uh, what is about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Well, you know, I think unlike my previous career where it was that one-to-one -one trading time for money, now I'm sort of like getting a foothold here and getting places like, you know, it is the second, you know, probably right after this call, I'll go to my business checking account and make sure, you know, uh, rents are coming in and everything's going great. And, you know, the perpetual motion machine is starting to spin. You know, I've got a long ways to go. You know, I don't want to get sound too arrogant here, but like at this rate, you know, in that five to 10 year time horizon, it's going to be a totally different life for me and my family. So it's just great knowing that I'm moving down that, that road, even if it's incrementally. Totally. Yeah. It's fascinating getting to the stage where you do have that five to 10 year outlook. And it's like, what a difference compared to, you know, you're, whenever, you know, you're in the corporate world and it's like one year, you're just like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to get a raise, you know, next year. Now you're like, cool. In 10 years, we're, you know, we're going to be able to, you know, X this, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's definitely an, a very different uh, mindset. Yeah. It's like linear versus nonlinear, right? Like getting incremental raises is like a very linear chart where is what we're doing hockey sticks. So correct. So the get rich slow scheme, as they call it. Yep. I'll take it. Absolutely. Uh, favorite non real estate or investment related book? Uh, probably influenced by Robert Cialdini. I don't know if you've read that one, but it's a uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, everyone should read that, especially uh, people who are who work with a lot of people uh, in sales, capital raising, things like that. Uh, really great tips on just how to communicate, how the human mind actually is hardwired to work, and how to sort of navigate that. Totally, yeah, uh, very very important for sure. I love that. Put it on the list. Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh man, there's a lot of fun ones, but I think I would just go with like super intelligence. Just make me Lex Luthor smart or Iron Man smart. Cause once you're that smart, you could fly, you can have the super strength, you can, you know, build a suit. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but, I, love yeah, that. I just, I just want to be the, the greatest investor that's ever lived. And to have that, I think I just want the horsepower up here to like recognize amazing opportunities everywhere. Totally. I know the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And you're like, gosh, dang it. I thought I was smart. And then, you know, I know. there's a lot to, there's a lot of variables and stuff. Totally. Uh, yeah. Cool. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and learn more? Uh, you can go to upwealthcapital.com. That's my company. You can see my little logo here. Um, and just shoot me a message there. I'm also on Twitter, uh, Skylar underscore UWC. Uh, I'm actually becoming a lot more active on Twitter. I really like the real estate community out there. They're, they're a real, uh, Compared to LinkedIn, it's a it's a lot it's a little bit of a harder edge, but I like it. There's a lot of like hard truths being shared there, so I, I recommend it. And um, yeah, and you can email me at skylar.wealthcapital.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, always happy to talk to people and learn from them and share what we're doing. So hope to hear from the folks. Awesome, love that. We'll link it in the show notes. Make it super easy, Skylar. Thank you so much. This was absolutely amazing. All right, thanks so much for having me, man. This has been a lot of fun. Totally. Thank you again for tuning in. Who do you know that wants more cash flow? Share this episode with them so you can grow your cash flow together. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you're subscribed on your platform of choice so you never miss a new episode. Go to KataniCapitalGroup.com to learn more.